All right. So welcome everyone. Today we're going to be reviewing sprints 56 and 57. Uh, for intro slides, um, we have the teams and the current focus of the teams. And then for each team, we've got the current team members. And we do have a few new people I wanted to uh, call out. Let me just get this thing out of the way. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Oh, on the core functional team, um, Anatoly has joined us as a developer. Uh, okay. Why can't I see that? Oh, there we go. All right. Yes. So Anatoly has joined the core functional team. He's been on the team for a sprint and he's doing good work um, on uh, tags for requests. And then I saw a couple of other new team members in here somewhere. Um, here we are on Fully Jet. Um, Ruslan Lavrov, a Java developer, has joined the project. And then we also had a couple of new UX designers. So Artin Agroni and Irene Chang. So welcome everybody to Folio. We're glad to have you. Um, and now to talk about the Q1 2019 release milestones, I will actually turn it over to Jakob. We will take the slide in the next. Are you on Jakob? I am, thank you. Roughly, uh, I'll walk you through the, the, the plan for the Q1 release. Uh, we'll be publishing the detailed release uh, planning uh, timeline shortly. Uh, so the release started on the January 14th, uh, 2019, um, and it will uh, end on April 8th, uh, 2019, so just in time for Easter. Um, uh, pretty much a quarter, it's a bit shorter as you can see. Uh, from the point of view of module authors and, and teams working on portfolio functionality, two dates are pretty much essential for this, uh, for this release. Uh, the first date, March 25th, uh, that's the release deadline for all modules, uh, part of Platform Complete. Uh, Platform Complete is, of course, the, the set of all folio modules, all folio functionality that is deployed as part of any given release. Uh, so all modules uh, must be released according to the folio release guidelines uh, by the state uh, in order to be included in the release. And the second deadline, uh, which is uh, which is uh, less critical but uh, but important for a, uh, uh, select teams that work on the core modules, that's March 15th, uh, uh, where Platform Core, which is a subset, subset of modules um, uh, being developed by the core team, uh, Unum, Vega, and, and occasionally some other teams, uh, will be uh, will be released. Um, so those two dates are. Uh, are pretty important. As you can see, uh, this time around, we left less time uh, for, the, for the, the, the release procedures. Only a sprint, uh, uh, many of the release procedures have been automated, uh, and the platform team was working on, on, on further automation. Uh, so we believe it should be a, uh, an easier task this time around. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't know, Kate, do you want to mention something about the functional uh function no no i just just for reference i checked today and there are currently 105 functional features in scope for the release and um, you can see the details plus all of the nfrs that are in scope um, by clicking the link to go to the dashboard but i don't think we need to look at that today so okay um, okay so next slide Definition of done, uh, so I believe I'll take that too. Uh, we've uh, presented some updates to the definition of done uh, during the last trend review. Uh, uh, many of those were existing uh, in, 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 in the DOD documents for, for many teams, uh, so we just reinforced that the stories uh, uh, that will be demoed need to pass manual QA, uh, and uh, integration tests need to be passing. Uh, uh, which is mostly relevant for platform core um, modules uh, where those integration tests are uh, utilized. 
the um, unit on automated tasks uh, as per uh, DOD uh, need to be at least on the 80% uh, marker for a new functionality and the demos will be conducted from an integration environment, uh, which may differ uh, from team to team. Uh, many teams uh, use share the same environment, that portfolio um, uh, snapshot. Uh, some teams have their, their own. And going forward requirements, um, uh, specifically a new requirement to provide better uh, documentation uh, for the APIs in Folio. Um, uh, we've already did some work, automatic uh, verification of API documentation in Folio for many projects, um, prompting developers to provide the description uh, metadata for uh, uh, for API uh, functions and, and fields. Uh, uh, those need to be extended. Some of those are requested by the um, uh, by the, the reporting um, uh, reporting team. Uh, and uh, some guidance has been provided as uh, part of existing JIRA issues, which target specific APIs where those changes need to be applied first, and those will be handled first. Uh, and those uh, will be turned into more general guidelines that will be published on, on, on devfolio.org. Um, uh, so uh, so those, uh, those guidelines should be, uh, should be used across the teams to, to provide quality documentation uh, for the APIs. Um, and as we discussed, um, we would like to increase the, uh, the frequency of releases uh, uh, for individual modules, which will effectively lead for increased frequency of releases for the entire Folio platform. Um, we, hope, uh, we hope to have um, a system in place after Q1, which will allow us to ship, uh, ship those version Folio releases more uh, more frequently uh, uh, compared to existing quarterly release cycle. Uh, so as a step towards that goal, uh, we've discussed and agreed on increasing the release frequency to every two sprints, which effectively means that every two sprints, every demo, system demo, uh, will be providing releases. Um, uh, I believe this been, has, has been discussed with some of the teams, uh, probably not all. Uh, so if there's any uh, reservations uh, or any uh, any issues with, with this approach, please let me know uh, because we would like to uh, introduce this as soon as possible. Um, uh, this will work um, uh, uh, jointly with with the new system uh, that is being set up for your release a system that will be automatically constructed whenever a module release is uh, available. Um, and that's all I have, I believe. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them now or later. All right. Thank you, Jakob. Right, thank, thank you, Kate. Okay, so um, each of the teams has uh, recorded their highlights from the past couple of sprints, so you can see them here. We won't go through them, um, but much of this will be shown in the demos. So just cruising through and here we go. So now to the demos. Um, this time around, we've got uh, Thunderjet, FullyJet, Vega, Core Functional, ERM, and then Anton will do a QA update if we have time. Um, so let's get started with Thunderjet and acquisitions. Um, Alexi, looks like you might be first. <clears throat> Are you on? Uh, yes, I'm here. All Hello. right. Hi, let me stop sharing. Uh, hope you see my screen. Yes, we do. Okay, so I'm going to uh, show you demo for acquisitions uh, team or at least start uh, showing demo uh, we will use for the snapshot latest uh, environment um, and um, uh, nevertheless we most of work provided to uh, receiving uh, functionality is still in progress uh, but uh, we can show you uh, several features 
a Gaussian integration of uh, orders and inventory. Um, also, I'm going to talk about uh, P-line number. Um, so let's go to orders app and um, uh, I have created uh, an order, uh, just a regular order uh, in pending uh, status uh, without peer lines. Uh, so uh, we have such a thing as peer line number. It's internal folder uh, identificator for peer line and uh, uh, while creating it, uh, it's uh, generated on backend. Uh, so on create peer line form, uh, we uh, don't have any input for this. Earlier there was uh, like user input, but right now it's system generated. So let's create a, a regular peer line. Something is physical resource. We can enter some cost details and click pre API line. Uh, we can observe here uh, API line number. It consists uh, from uh, purchase order number uh, as a prefix and uh, sequence set number as a suffix. Uh, maximum number is uh, 999 uh, and uh, it's uh, always sequentially. Uh, so if you delete uh, peer line, uh, it will not go back, just uh, go further. So regarding uh, integration with inventory, uh, let's have purchase of physical resource with uh, some price, some quantity, and uh, in item details block we have title field uh, with uh, integration uh, with inventory. Here, uh, let's pick up uh, some item or instance. And uh, we fetch, uh, now we fetch uh, details like publisher, publication date, edition, that kind of stuff, uh, the same as contributor. Uh, I think material type was uh, there before. Uh, yep. So PLN is created and uh, we do have such additional details uh, fetched. Uh, regarding locations, uh, I think uh, Peter uh, will provide uh, more cool features. Uh, Peter? Okay, hey everyone. So let me just share my screen. Hope you can see it already. That's good. Yeah, so I would like to present uh, uh, a flow when order is being uh, moved from pinned into open status, which uh, potentially might involve uh, interaction between orders and uh, inventory applications. So I've already prepared uh, uh, some pending order and that uh, interaction basically depends on uh, purchase order line structure. So that's why I created uh, an order and uh, with three different uh, purchase order lines. So just let's briefly uh, look at the first one in details, let's say. And the first one is uh, of uh, physical resource order format. And uh, we would like to order uh, 10 uh, physical uh, items or resources and 
Uh, as Alexei already mentioned, uh, a new feature is just uh, uh, location block, location accordion, and uh, all these locations are uh, from an inventory. For uh, current case, uh, uh, I would like to re uh, actually order se uh, seven physical resources to main library and uh, uh, three to second floor. So we can add more locations if needed. And also there is uh, uh, some validation checks that uh, it cannot exceed uh, the number specified in the cost, some of these uh, uh, quantities. So also uh, to create some records uh, in inventory, some data is, uh, is mandatory. So uh, for example, to create uh, instance, uh, title has to be provided. I already uh, filled in some data with uh, uh, a bit more details to create items, material types required, and so on. So I already prepared this uh, data filled in. And uh, for physical resources, we always create uh, uh, records in inventory, it includes instance holdings and items. And uh, for example, let's uh, review uh, the second uh, purchase order line, which is uh, of electronic resource format. And uh, the, uh, the main uh, difference for this one is uh, that there is a flag. Uh, either to create any records in inventory or not. So basically it's named as create item, but uh, actually it creates all uh, instances, holdings and items if checked. And for this example, I just uh, uh, specified one uh, electronic resource and uh, uh, which will go to popular reading collection, one electronic item. And uh, finally, the third one, purchase order line is of uh, mixed format, physical electronic. And uh, for this, uh, just for demonstration purposes, create item flag is unchecked. This means that uh, uh, for, for such uh, uh, resources, there won't be any item created at all. And uh, uh, one location, I specify that all 10 physical resources, in cause details, we can see that I specify 10 uh, physical and one electronic, and uh, all 10 physical will be uh, for NX location. So basically that's it about order from uh, order structure I prepared and just uh, let's go to inventory just to verify that uh, there is no any instance for Harry Potter book. As you might uh, uh, notice, all purchase order lines for different Harry Potter books. Let's go back to order then and uh, now let's transit uh, order from pending to open. Once we click this, actually uh, uh, we see that uh, it's already updated and work workflow status uh, changed to open, but uh, in reality there was uh, interaction between uh, orders and inventory and we now see that three instances uh, uh, available for Harry Potter. And let, let's have a look at the first one, for example. This one uh, uh, was for uh, the first purchase order line, which was of uh, physical uh, resource format. And we see that some details already filled in for instance, like title, identifiers, etc. cetera. And uh, uh, we see that uh, two holdings already created. And uh, each holding has uh, uh, the number of items we, we specified. All of these items now on order. And uh, this will be uh, just a starting for, point for receiving, which will be dis demonstrated uh, on next system demo, I believe. And uh, just to briefly demonstrate the, the rest of the instances, the second one was for electronic resource, as I mentioned, and we see that there is only one item electro with electronic resource of material type. And same with uh, for the third instance, which uh, contains only 10, uh, physical items. So basically I think that's it. And thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, I have a question. Um, who, I, where are the, how are the um, inventory uh, records created? Are they created by the UI or are they created by back um, a part of the back end? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and just uh, to add a bit uh, more details about the logic, so if there is already 
uh, existing list instance, uh, backend just searches for uh, identifier number, and if uh, instance found, uh, no any new instance created. Just that one is used, and uh, if no holding holding created, if uh, holding already is, exists, uh, that holding also used. All the time, items are, are being created, and purchase order ID is uh, linked to that particular item. So if no any questions, I think that's it from my side. Thank you very much again. Really, really cool. I It's really cool to see this come together. We've been talking about it for so long, seeing acquisitions and in inventory integrated. It's amazing. Yeah. Really, <laughs> really cool. Awesome, yeah. <laughs> Major kudos, guys. Congratulations. <clears throat> All right, cool. So uh, who was next? Um, okay, so next, uh, Fully Jet um, with Taras. Looks like Taras is first. Uh, yep, I'm uh, here. Hello, everyone. Hi. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Uh, okay, so. Uh, uh, in uh, this sprint, we've spent uh, uh, some time to uh, remove code smells and uh, increase our uh, testing coverage. So as you see, uh, we have uh, moved forward. So already uh, four uh, of our modules uh, have uh, at least 80% or uh, even a bit more. And we, uh, we have just three uh, modules we left with um, uh, lower uh, test coverage, but uh, we have tasks to improve this as well. So uh, at the end of this sprint, I think we will have all green on our board uh, on Sonar. So briefly, that's it from my side. Uh, Okay. okay, thanks to us. Yep. Um, all right. So then it looks like Sasha is next. Yep. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, let, let me continue our presentations with uh, showing uh, some uh, file support functionality. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. So let me start with. Uh, Uploading a few files. Uh, from that moment, uh, we can uh, navigate away, and uh, here uh, on the third pane, we uh, can see uh, this um, message uh, that we have files in progress. And uh, from uh, from here, we can. Uh, press resume button and it will navigate us uh, back to job profiles page uh, where we uh, still have uh, all of uploaded files and uh, we are able to uh, do all the operations with them uh, like deleting and uh, so on uh, and other functionalities that will be implemented in uh, future. Um, so yes, deleting works. Um, um, here we also have uh, this delete button, which will delete uh, all the files. And we can start uploading again. Uh, so another scenario is uh, when we upload in files and we are trying to navigate away. Uh, in that case, we'll have this uh, model which uh, gives us two options uh, keep uploading which will just uh, do nothing and uh, close and lose uploads uh, which will navigate us away and we will don't have uh, files uh, uploaded um, we can also try to close the tab and in that case uh, we'll have another kind of model. Uh, uh, the reason why this model doesn't uh, uh, 
uh, look like the previous one is because of some browser limitations. Um, so, but uh, basically those two buttons are doing the same thing. We can either leave the page or cancel and stay and uh, finish file uploads. Um, so uh, I think uh, that's it from my side. And now uh, my colleague Victor will proceed our presentation. Um, yep, uh, thank you. Could you please uh, stop sharing? Yeah, hi guys. Uh, let me share my screen. So uh, do you see it? Please confirm it. Yes, we do. Great. So uh, I just wanted to add on top uh, uh, the presentation which Taras made about uh, covering this uh, unit test as uh, uh, the previous sprint we spent a lot of time of writing unit tests for our uh, UI data import application and we increased the coverage uh, from uh, about 30% uh, to uh, up to seven, 17 and uh, now we have uh, also stories in our current sprint to increase it even more. So. I uh, hope you uh, get soon uh, our, uh, our UI application all, also as green. Uh, so, and now uh, file extension, uh, which I previously demoed, and uh, here we added possibility to create a new file extension. And uh, as we can see uh, here, we have uh, optional description field and uh, uh, required file extension field and uh, and by default, we also have the data types field as uh, required, but we can uh, avoid uh, requiring it uh, by clicking block import. So, and uh, for all these cases, uh, there is a validation to ensure it. So let's create some, uh, uh, let's uh, actually, I show you uh, that there is a bunch of predefined uh, file extensions, so let's say, uh, start with showing uh, validation when we try to create a file extension which already exists, for example, CSV. In that case, we are going to have uh, an error uh, which says that uh, this file extension is already exists. So let's try to uh, also demonstrate another uh, UI validation uh, which is just to ensure that we uh, uh, enter only valid data. So this is uh, stuff which is now validated on the UI, but we also have the same validation on the backend just to ensure it uh, when uh, we can uh, try to create uh, new file extensions, not via UI application. And uh, let uh, me show, yeah, in case if we uh, and does not, if you don't click uh, block import button, in that case we have, as I said, data types required. And let's check, uh, for example, this one and try to create it. So in that case, we have uh, our uh, item in, uh, the, in the end of the list and uh, we'll uh, have in the, on the first uh, demo, the screen uh, with uh, details but, but now we also can see that uh, our data which we filled out uh, is exist uh, here. And uh, now, uh, as I said, uh, we have uh, by default some predefined file extensions, which technically speaking are not created by the user. So we mark this as system created. And uh, once uh, some user uh, change this, we have some real user. In that case, we have uh, this data for DQ admin, which is the current user. And, uh, and also uh, we have uh, additional validation, uh, actually error handling in case if we lose the connection. So in case if I uh, try to uh, create uh, this uh, request, uh, when there is uh, no internet connection and I doing this by simulating offline in the Chrome uh, developer tools. We also will have another error uh, for this case. And uh, also as usual for any form, uh, uh, we have this functionality. Uh, so 
which says that there is there are some unsavory changes and uh, we uh, the standard model errors and actually th there were a, a tiny bug uh, with this behavior previously and uh, uh, thanks to uh, M Michael Kuklis, uh, uh, this issue is gone. Uh, but the issue was uh, actually that once we click uh, this uh, X button one once, and uh, we uh, clicked keep editing, uh, we won't be able to click this again. So uh, as uh, clicks on this button, we end up in nothing. So uh, take, uh, this actually pretty much all from me, thank you. Thanks, that looks awesome. I have a question about um, what if you allow a file type that Folio can't interpret, like a JPEG or something? Uh, can we allow or would you please repeat? I, it looked like you were able to just put in any type of any file extension and say whether it was allowed or not. And they have uh, a misunderstanding. And yeah, aren't there some that just can't be interpreted? Uh, we, uh, for, for, for the moment, we have uh, the basic validation. So, uh, but uh, in the, uh, we have on the list a ticket uh, for ensuring, uh, for adding additional uh, layer of validation. So uh, to allow, uh, to create only those file extensions which are specified somewhere. But this uh, work should be done both on the front end and the back end. Got it. Okay, Thank thanks. <clears throat> uh, okay, so um, next is Vega with Maxim. I think. Are, are you there? Yeah, uh, one second, I'm trying to share my screen. You're very quiet. Can you please try to increase yes. the volume? Can you hear me well? Sound good to me. Okay. Uh, so uh, today we are going to uh, show you a new entity for circulation module and it's called genotize policy. In order to uh, have an ability to use this entity, we need to set up uh, corresponding templates. And uh, I already did this, but I show the templates. Uh, please pay attention on category field because this field will be used in uh, Natai's policy and I will show in a minute how. So in order to create new policy, uh, we are uh, going to Natai's policy uh, list and create new entity. So let's try to create this entity. And uh, uh, here we have an ability to create uh, uh, two type of notice. First is loan notice and second one is request notice. Let's start from a loan notice. Um, so in template field, uh, we have loan template, uh, and this template is loaded from the patron notice templates, uh, which I showed a minute ago. Uh, so it's a template with loan category. So let's proceed with uh, filling the form, and uh, let's uh, check necessary fields. Uh, also, please note that uh, when we choose recurring uh, value for frequency field, a uh, new field appear here, uh, sent every, and also uh, let's create a uh, setup. So, um, Uh, here we go. So also uh, all these fields are required. So for example, if we try to uh, save the entity, we will we see uh, validation for these fields. And let's try to create request notices. Uh, as you see here, we have only request template. And let's create one more entity. Uh, 
and trying to save this. So, uh, so here we see uh, uh, display mode of uh, test policy and all the fields uh, save it correctly. And uh, uh, here we have a menu uh, which allow us to uh, duplicate the entity, edit and delete. Uh, let's try to duplicate this. Uh, here we see uh, all this form already viewed with uh, the data from the previous uh, entity and in order to uh, save it we need to update for example title and save. Uh, as you can see we uh, created new policy. We also can edit from here. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, we already have this name. Uh, we can update it and also delete this policy. I guess it's all from my side. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. Looks good. Thanks, Maxim. Thank you. Uh, Dimitro is up next from Vega. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm starting sharing my screen. Uh, please let me know if something goes wrong. So uh, today I'm going to demonstrate the functionality, the closed library due date management functionality. The main idea of it is to ensure that uh, due date of a loan is set uh, or to open library hours. Um, so uh, here we have uh, the calendar where uh, those uh, open hours can be defined. It's, uh, it's a timetable. Uh, and uh, the main settings of this um, functionality are in loan policy. Uh, here I should say that there are two types of loans. Uh, first is long-term loans. It is defined, it's those which defined, uh, who, which have period uh, um, defined in um, days, week or months, uh, or, uh, and short-term loans uh, with period of uh, minutes or hours. The main difference between them is that long-term loans are only care about uh, due date, but not time. Um, uh, and today I'm going to show how short-term loans works. Um, for example, I have a loan policy with uh, 12 hours loan. Um, from these uh, settings, I can set what, what I want um, uh, uh, to do what I what what I want to do uh, with um, with the due date. First option is to uh, keep uh, due, due date time as is uh, when it's calculated. So uh, just ignoring that um, a library is closed for that day. Uh, let's take a look um, at the calendar. I have a timetable. Uh, the library opens from 12 to 7 uh, p.m. Uh, but there is one exceptional day, it's tomorrow, uh, that on that day the library is closed. So when I uh, create a 12 hours loan, it will get on um, closed day. Now let's try this. Uh, also, please take into account that um, uh, current implementation does not take into account the um, predefined uh, time zone, so all calculations are in uh, UTC. And now it's uh, 4 p.m. UTC. And here we got just simple uh, loan in a uh, 12 hours. And let's change the settings to, for example, move to the end of current service point hours. Um, 
Uh, current, current service point hours means the period where we are now. It's um, from 12 to 7 p.m. Uh, uh, today. Uh, and the loan date should be moved to 7 uh, p.m. And here we got it. Uh, another option of um, the loan policy is to move uh, due date to the beginning of the next uh, service point hours. Uh, also, there is a possibility uh, to set uh, an offset time uh, so that allowing patron not to bring um, uh, item just uh, when uh, library opens. Uh, let's take a look at the calendar. So uh, the next open uh, hours will be on the 28th, uh, as um, there is except exceptional period for uh, tomorrow, and it should be moved by 30 minutes of set from 12 o'clock. Um, so here we have it. It's uh, yeah, 28, uh, uh, 12.30 p.m. Um, so I think that's all from my side. Uh, thank you for your attention. Wow, that's <laughs> amazing to see that working. That's really complex stuff. Thank you for sharing. Um, all right. Uh, actually, for core functional, I'm going to be demonstrating today because Michal is, was not able to make this meeting. So um, let me just share my screen again. <clears throat> and see where. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so the first story that I wanted to demonstrate was um, request policies. So request policies um, determine whether and how a request can be made by a given patron for a given item. Um, and the policies are executed at the time of request creation. Um, so when a request is created, the system is going to look at the patron group of the, the requester and then the properties of the item. So, for example, um, the item type, the material type, um, <clears throat> and eventually location. And it will determine, one, whether the request is allowed, and then later um, how the request can be made. Um, so, for example, um, you know, it's delivery allowed or not for this type of request. Um, so, you know, some institutions may, for example, say certain patron groups are not allowed to create recall requests or um, maybe certain item types are not holdable. Um, so that's what these policies are for. And um, we have created the request policies and you'll see them here in settings. And right now they're super simple. Um, so what you can do now is you can create the request policy, you give it a name and a description, and then you just say what type of requests are allowed. Um, so again, really simple, and we will be extending this later to include other request governing settings, like, as I said, whether delivery is allowed or is it only available for pickup at the hold shelf. Um, there were some other settings that we considered putting in the request policy that relate to requests, like recall return interval, minimum loan period for recalled items, and so on. But those things actually ended up being put into the loan policy because they really have more to do with how the loan is created and managed, whereas this request policy is really about whether and how requests can be created. Um, so, so far we just have the request policy form. Um, we are working on making these um, policies effective. So they'll be tied into the um, circulation rules. So that same editor that we have um, for loan rules is being extended so that they can target um, other types of policies. 
And um, once we've got that all um, fit together, we will begin work on um, making these policies effective at the time of request creation. So we should be able to show that in the next demo. Um, oh, I should also say um, that we're using a lot of shared components here. So a lot of the stuff that, um, that you saw um, when we were looking at patron notice policies, like say for example, the ability to duplicate, this kind of came for free. I mean, I didn't even put in a story for this and it just it was done, um, which is kind of cool. Um, so we have the ability to duplicate, <clears throat> we have the ability to delete and so on. Um, so that is the request policy so far. Um, the next thing I wanted to show was um, print slip print defaults. So um, Folio currently supports two types of um, staff slips, hold and transit. And the text of the slips can be customized and can include tokens. And I've shown all this before, so I'm not going to show that. Um, but basically these things are, can be generated or printed at um, the time of check-in. Um, so, but some service points where an item may be checked in may not have a printer. Um, and some institutions may not use certain print slips. So like, for example, Chalmers doesn't plan to use um, transit slips because they have other ways of making sure that things are going to the right place. Um, so to, to support this kind of variability between and across um, libraries, we've implemented the ability to configure whether or not a staff slip prints by default by service point. So I'm going to move over to organization and then go to service points. And we've got two service points here. Um, let's take a look at circ desk two. And you'll see that there's now a new section here, print by default. Um, and so you can say for each service point, whether or not you want to print each of these um, stiff slips by default. Um, so we've set this up so that hold slips will not print by default, but transit slips will. And then I'll show you how that works. So if we go into a request, um, and this request is awaiting pickup at circ desk two, and I am logged in at circ desk two. So if I check this in again, it should give me the, the hold slip. It's basically going to say this thing is awaiting pickup and it's going to ask me if I want to print the hold slip um, because that's when hold slips are printed. Um, but it shouldn't print by default because um, for this service point, hold slips are not printing by default. So you can see that it says it's awaiting pickup for a request, put it on the hold shelf, but print slip is not checked. Um, so I could just close this and move on. Um, but if I wanted to go ahead and print it anyway, I always have the option to kind of override at the, um, you know, in, within the modal. So I could print it anyway. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that right now the system is generating kind of this um, print preview. Um, there is a way to avoid this. Most institutions do not want to have to go in here and print from here. Just have it go directly to the printer without this intermediate step. I just don't have that set up here on my machine. So that was the, um, the hold slip and you saw that it was not printed by default. And then if I do this one, so this is one that was awaiting pickup at circ desk one. So if I check it in at circ desk two, it's gonna go in transit. <clears throat> and um, we should see that the checkbox is, yeah, checked by default. Yeah, so there's, it is going to print this uh, by default, but again, I can always uncheck it. So that is the um, print slip stuff. Um, the next item is hold shelf ex expiration period at the service point. So this is another thing that we've added to the service point uh, record. So in here, um, we now have the ability to specify for each service point an expiration period um, for the hold shelf. And right now we're just able to, or what I'll be showing today is just the ability to, you know, to, um, to specify here at the, um, at the service point. And you can, you know, do this in minutes, hours, days, weeks, months. Um, but um, there is work underway actually nearly complete um, where we're actually looking at that um, 
that period. So basically when an item is checked in, say at circ desk two, then the system will look at what is the hold shelf expiration period for circ desk two, it's five weeks, and it will look at today's date, add five weeks, and that becomes the hold shelf expiration date. So we'll show that next time. Um, another uh, thing I wanted to show is here, um, I showed you the, the the staff slips, you know, how they're, um, you have the option to print them. Um, but sometimes you, I don't know, printing doesn't work or um, you want to reprint. And so we've added this option here just to print the slips directly from the check-in page. So you can just uh, print slips, hold slip. So that's working. And then um, finally, the last thing I wanted to show is um, we are also working on catch up um, stories for improving UI test coverage. And one of the things that Michal worked on was um, UI check in and bringing that up to 80% coverage. And um, when I checked today, it was down to 78 again, but it was definitely at 80% when this story passed test. And um, yeah, it, it, I guess, I think it was at 58. So there has been a huge improvement. We got to get it back up over 80%, um, but um, we have made a big improvement there. And I know that other developers are looking at improving other modules as well. Anton is writing stories for our backlog. Um, Matt Connolly, for example, is working on UI checkout as well, I guess, to bring that up to 80%. So we are making improvements here, and I'm sure Anton will talk about that a little bit later on. So that's all I had, any questions? All right, um, okay, so next up is the ERM subgroup developers with Owen and or Ian. Hi, it's Owen here, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, let's share. So, um, uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, in this uh, sprint, we've been mainly looking at developing the license functionality, which is uh, licenses are where we record uh, kind of some of the legal documents that govern access to electronic resources and, um, uh, and gather information about what those documents say about the use of the resources. Um, so, uh, essentially most of the work on licenses being done in this sprint, um, we can now create uh, a new license. Well, we could already do that, but we now have a full kind of set of metadata about the license. So we have the license name, uh, type of license, which could be local, consortial, national or alliance, and uh, the status. So uh, obviously some licenses might, uh, when you first start working on them, might not be agreed yet, they're in negotiation and they can move forward uh, to active or be rejected. Um, uh, and licenses can have start and end dates. So uh, we have that. Um, uh, perhaps obviously the uh, end date can't be before the start date. Um, and I can go ahead and create that license. And there we have uh, the license created. Oh, sorry, a bit background noise here. Um, and um, so we can see that I've set that uh, basic license information. Um, just on the end date, if I edit that license, then users have said that sometimes they want to record an end date, but sometimes they want to say explicitly that license is open-ended. That is, that it, the, the kind of terms continue for uh, forever or for, for the indefinite future. There's no end date specified. So they can check that it's an open-ended uh, license and in that case, that clears the end date and shows here that uh, this is an open-ended license um, and no, no end date is set. So that's explicit as opposed to just not setting an end date, which might be a mistake or um, uh, just not recorded during the, um, if a uh, license is in the process of being negotiated, it might not have an end date agreed yet. Uh, so the difference between just leaving it blank and having it explicitly open-ended. Um, so once we have a license, as I say, it's the place where we can gather a set of terms about the use of the uh, resource. 
So we have um, what we call the license terms here, and we have um, a whole set of terms. This can be tenant defined, so um, uh, institutions can decide exactly what terms they want. We've set up some of the more uh, common terms uh, in this test system. Um, and um, these can have different values. So the definition of an authorized user here is just a text value. I can write in whatever the license says. So they have to be an enrolled student or whatever it is. Um, uh, number of concurrent users allowed um, is an integer. So I, I won't be able to put in uh, save text in that. It has to be an integer number if it's set. Um, and then I can also have uh, kind of lists of um, values for a, a, a term. Um, so in this case, is walking access permitted? Yes, no, um, other. Uh, or um, things like, uh, can I provide electronic interlibrary loan requests based on this resource? Um, it's not just a yes or no, but whether it's been permitted explicitly by the license or whether I've interpreted it as permitted in the license. Um, and again, these lists of the list of terms of value, sorry, that go with the terms are tenant defined. So um, this was what the users said that uh, were, were kind of a common set of uh, terms, but uh, and values, but they could um, they can set up their own. So there's no restriction on that um, when you're uh, installing this portfolio yourself. And this set of terms here. Um, are what we call the primary or default terms. So these have been defined again for the tenant as um, as default. Um, for so I always see these. So these are kind of the standard set of terms the institution expects to fill in for every license. Um, but there are some other terms as well that um, I can add. So some less common terms, for instance, I don't know some license term on the metadata usage, um, which is a text term. Um, but um, uh, so I can put in a, some values here um, and update the license. And when I save those, then you can see that those are now displaying in um, in this uh, display here. But because um, we have a defined set of default terms that are expected by the institution, even if they don't set. Uh, for instance, the number of concurrent users or what the interlibrary loan restrictions are, they still display. So I can see that they're not, they've not been set for this license. Um, the non-default terms like metadata usage only display if they are set. So um, we don't get huge lists of terms here, even if the, the library wants to support, you know, maybe a longer list of terms, it doesn't have to see them all, all the time. Um, so that is um, the terms. Um, yeah. Uh, and so the next thing I wanted to show was um, link of organizations to licenses. So licenses um, can have um, different uh, organizations related to them in different roles. So here, um, oh, we've got an empty list. So let me create a new organization. Um, so let's say this is an EBSCO resource. Oh, it already exists. Hmm. Uh, let's say this is a JSTOR resource. Um, then, uh, then I can say this is a this is a JSTOR resource, and that so they're the licensor in this case, um, and I can add that in, um, and so I can add licensors and licensees and other uh, other organisations in relation to the license. Um, but the licensor is treated specially, so um, while I can kind of have whatever licenses um, organizations I want in relation to the license I can only add one license or so if I try and add um, another license or here then it will tell me only one is allowed but for other um, other other roles I might be able to have um, multiple subscription consortia or whatever uh, uh, allowed 
um, I can uh, I can have the uh, multiple organisations fulfilling that role, and um, that means that also we can display the license or here on the screen because we know we expect that just to be one license or um, which keeps that simple for display as well as for management on the uh, by the organizer by the uh, institution um, okay so that's kind of around the basic license stuff um, and uh, final things um, is just around search so we have a search and filter screen for the license um, by default this is uh, has the active status so only licenses that are active display so you're not seeing all your expired or rejected licenses by default but obviously you can change that and at the moment we have um, just search by name um, and status and type um, but uh, we expect we'll extend that um, and one of the extensions we're going to do is uh, being able to search by organization. And one of the other things we've done in the sprint is actually implement that already on the other type of object we've got here, which is an agreement. Um, so um, here under agreement, you can see this is how it will work for um, licenses as well. I can select an organization and I find all the um, agreements that are linked to that organization but I can also select a role for that organization so um, I can look to see if there's um, uh, anywhere JSTOR is the provider or the content provider and see okay there's, so there's just the one in the, the one agreement where JSTOR is the content provider but there are there are um, three agreements where JSTOR uh, is linked in some way to the agreement. So in a different role, presumably in this case, uh, uh, we have um, JSTOR is the, the subscription consortia in this case. So we're gonna, that's been implemented in agreements in this sprint, and we're gonna bring that across to licenses um, in the next sprint. Um, so we'll be seeing the same kind of filter here, uh, which is a double, a two layer filter. First you filter by organization and then by uh, organization role and I think that is everything uh, unless there are any questions are you in a nightclub <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm outside I'm, <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm outside by a railway <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for doing a demo outside by the railway. It looks really good, Owen. Um, all right. I think next we had, I think, yes. Okay. Next up is um, Anton with the QA update. Anton, do you want to pull up the slides or do you want me to pull them up? If you could pull them up, Kate, would be great. Okay. Sure. Yep. <clears throat> Yes, so that's my first slide. So regular stats on the escape defects, overall escape defects kind of reflect on the uh, health of the project. And I have to say that uh, we, have, uh, we have 495 unresolved defects as of right now and average uh, age of those defects uh, is pretty, um, pretty old, so it's like 220 days on average. So what I would like to encourage you guys to do is for your particular module, groom your defects and I bet you you can close a lot of them because probably a lot of them are old and not even applicable to the current state of the app. Uh, but that being say, said, and in general for each module, you, or, uh, you should have maybe as many defects as you have fingers on your on your hand, and if you have more than that, then it means it should it tells you that things are getting out of uh, hand on your particular project. So actually, we made a pretty good progress on UI users during this sprint when defect count went from seventy six to fifty two. So that's a good jump. So. 
uh, just because I have a lot of people on the line, I just like to encourage you guys, uh, each individual team, think how to groom and how to incorporate uh, defects that you're responsible for into your sprint and kind of start mulching them down slowly, not like drop everything and start fixing defects. But every sprint just bring in a um, certain amount of defects into um, uh, that you'll be working on and balance it with the features that product owner wants you to do as well. So that we should see the number of this decreasing, but right now it's pretty, pretty large number. And I'm not say, talking about all the modules. Some modules have a lot more than the others, but it's just frame of thought that my module needs to have no more than 10 defects if uh, kind of if you behave that way then you uh, we can have much better results and much cleaner um, project in terms of how many bugs we have outstanding uh, and obviously building tests helps because then it reduces number of defects uh, that escape okay kate could you please move to the next slide okay so there are a lot of questions I see in the channels popping up and there are a few things I would like to make clear. Uh, and it's regarding uh, direction that we're taking, uh, that we're taking in terms of what kind of tests we build, where we test and what, uh, what are we doing? Because people are spending time researching nightmare or doing a lot of work with nightmare uh, tests. So, uh, nightmare tests has been built um, uh, at the beginning of the projects and they've been used. Uh, most of those tests, the integration tests and some of those um, nightmare tests also uh, written for the, uh, for the individual uh, core modules of the folio. So we did evaluation of what the code coverage those tests provide and for any given module, it's anywhere from 30 to 40%. But we execute those tests only at the integration phase. So these tests don't give you uh, good feedback when you are in development mode. So uh, uh, this fall, we made decision that we'll be building unit tests for UI with big tests. And a lot of team following that, uh, following that decision and start building start building uh, code coverage for their respective for their respective modules. So we did a lot of prep work. So we created documentation, we have videos, we have code samples. So if anybody on this call kind of not aware of that and uh, would like to start uh, building code coverage for their modules, then please reach out to me directly and uh, I'll uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of get, uh, get, you, get you going. So from now on, we will use nightmare tests as our integration tests, but our focus should be on building code coverage with big tests and subsequently, subsequently with a packed framework that will be used to validate uh, interfaces between modules because we have uh, we have 40 plus backend modules. We have 30 plus UI modules. They all can, it's a microservices architecture. It can change, each module can change independently of each other and introducing the breaking change to the other module. So the communication between modules is essential um, uh, prior to integration test. And this is what packed, um, uh, packed framework will achieve. And uh, we're still in the research, uh, so I will communicate more information about PACT as it becomes available, but right now it's just our strategic thought that we will use PACT to validate uh, uh, REST interfaces between between the modules. And it's not just between front end and back end, it's also can be between two back end modules as well. So that being said, our focus should be on building a battery of unit tests, both on back end and front end, so that developer, whoever comes into the project, 
has a quick feedback and a quick learning curve knowing how the system works because they can fi uh, read the test and figure out what system was designed to do because um, test implements that, uh, that uh, those design requirements. Then uh, unit tests will prevent, uh, prevent uh, untested code committed to master because, um, well, they're, uh, they're still often that uh, we have a chance that it, uh, it can happen. So, and because we have more tests upfront during our uh, development mode or during module build, uh, build phase, then we should have less of a failures during our integration tests. So again, bottom line, focus on the building unit tests that you run on your on your uh, dev environment and that you run subsequently on your uh, branch build and then your uh, your master build and uh, uh, so start uh, build big tests build j unit tests and subsequently when we figure out how to uh, how to build pack tests we'll communicate we'll provide the knowledge transfer We'll have videos, we'll have documentation, so we will be able to enable everyone to, pro, uh, to build interface tests for their respective modules. Okay, so Kate, could you please move to the next slide? So UI automation testing. Well, we are making pretty nice progress here. Three months ago, the screenshot that you see on the left, I apologize that it's small, but if you go to the Sonar, Sonar uh, Cloud and just filter on UI module and sort by coverage, you'll see that we have 10 out of 32 modules, UI modules that already have big test uh, instrumented. We didn't have that. We only had uh, eHoldings uh, module uh, three months ago that was doing that. So we're making a great progress there and I encourage everyone who is not on board with that, I didn't start that. Reach out to me and we'll get you going in terms of helping you learn and figure out how to add big tests to, uh, to your modules. So there is a link in this presentation to useful resources. It's uh, documentation and videos. And uh, so you can start there and if you need help, just reach out to me. So many teams, and it's, uh, I'm very happy to see that core functional team adopting Scrum process and subsequently working towards changing their definition of done that would require building unit tests. And as a result of that, UI check-in module went uh, above 80%. Uh, and I know that the team works on UI checkout coverage as well. Uh, other teams are doing a great job and following the best practices in terms of building uh, building UI unit test coverage are Fullerjet, Vegas, Spitfire, Thunderjet, all contributed to the uh, improved numbers that we see in the study code analysis. So, and I also uh, met with the UNAM team and they are adopting the big, uh, big, te uh, big test um, as well and incorporated into their work on fees and fines. Okay, so uh, that's all on the uh, unit, uh, unit test code coverage. Now, a little bit on performance. So we have a battery of performance tests. Uh, we're still having discussion how to use them and how valuable they are. So uh, I advise you to look at this uh, seconds, not as a quantitative measure, but more like relative measure. So it's uh, think about seconds more like story points, not like actual seconds in that matter. And if you look at the numbers, you can see that majority of our API is performing pretty well and only uh, tests abo above the red line are slow. So what I'm trying to say, if we, if we just focus on the APIs that don't perform well, and it's merely like less than 50 of them, we can, um, we can actually make, make a good progress and make the, uh, make, this, um, uh, make the app perform much better than it performs now. So 
it's no not all doom and gloom it's uh, actually focus effort can yield quick results here because proportionally we have fewer apis that uh, that uh, don't perform well compared to apis that perform perform well so that's kind of my summary on performance and that's pretty much what i have for now guys thank you thank you for your time and uh, if Anyone has question, please. Uh, uh, Anton, so yes. just so I'm just so I'm clear on this, um, you mentioned that the um, knowledge sharing um, for Pact was coming soon or later. Um, does that mean that teams should not be attempting to do, to build any Pact-based contract-based testing until until that guidance is provided? Uh, uh, no, that's not what uh, not what I meant. What I meant is that uh, we uh, some team that kind of accepts this responsibility needs needs to be a trailblazer, right? And kind of uh, create that path for everybody else. So, as an example, uh, eHoldings and the um, uh, the, the team that Jeffrey, Jeffrey was working on, they built a lot of tests and they helped with documentation and they helped to kind of spread, spread the knowledge and build the sample codes, uh, sample um, unit tests for other modules and uh, contributed a lot to the, uh, to the Stripe CLI to uh, to uh, to instrument big test uh, for the module. So a lot of work has been done by one team to enable other teams. So I think we will follow the same pattern here. And I know that uh, I think uh, there's a spike in the Thunderjet team or Foliajet team that has that work. We had multiple attempts at PAC that um, didn't yield uh, usable results. So we already, we had one kind of round trip of the pack test running, but we ran into the mock server issue that we have to have to resolve. Uh, and I don't want to kind of go into deep details. So, but anybody who is interested in pack tests, please ping me uh, directly and maybe we can form that pack test uh, kind of interest group or uh, kind of task force where we will manage those tasks and we will uh, we will figure out how to how to how to make it work but to me it's kind of uh, blind uh, well pretty much obvious that we need to do that because if I am a backend and I change the interface, introduce the uh, breaking change, then I should be able to automatically trigger builds across all the uh, for all the modules that depend on my interface, and uh, break those builds, and then uh, give uh, owners of those uh, of those builds of those those module a signal that something is broken and it needs to be fixed. We cannot afford to wait until integration, we run integration test to find out that somebody uh, pulled the rug from under us and changed the interface. We need to know it at the module build level. And the only way to do that is to have two-way uh, two communication that PACT framework provides. So that being said, anyone who's interested in packed um, uh, work, just kind of on the side or just for fun of it, uh, then please reach out to me. And that, because we kind of need to form that um, kind of group of people, same way we did with the uh, with the uh, big test, and then from there we can kind of distribute tasks and figure out how to how to get it out so that every team can just pick it up and do it any other questions for anton i have another one um and it's a really quick one the performance tests 
Yes. Um, is, the, is, is that, that, that number of two seconds, is that number, that number applies to all APIs, irrespective of what the API does, I'm guessing. So we were aiming to get everything under two seconds. Well, that's our, that's our, that's our dream. I think it's, it will need to be much faster than two seconds, but I think we kind of need to approach uh, our performance efforts in, in, in steps. Right, so I think if I would, um, uh, so it would be kind of very frustrating if you cannot reach the goal. So, uh, so my idea was first, let's look at the slowest let's, uh, APIs. Let's look what kind of slowness they cause, where they are. And right now they are mostly in the inventory and inventory is a heart of the folio because a lot of things depends on the inventory search, right? Uh, and if somebody cannot do check-in, check-out, uh, search uh, uh, on the inventory items, then that's kind of pretty much kills the usability of, of the system. So, and again, these tests are running against the system that is weak. So, uh, and by week, I mean uh, the AWS instances that uh, the, where those tests are running, they're not very powerful. In a way, it's a good thing because when you run your test, when your tests are running fast on a weak uh, virtual hardware, it's a good sign. So, uh, but uh, what I'm trying to say here, these numbers, they kind of good for decision making and for the trend checking. So, and they're also good for highlighting that we have a problem and we need to start focusing on performance because before it's too late, because when a release goes to Chalmers and, and it's only a few months left, and then they, they're piling up lines of p patrons that waiting for the book to be checked out and it takes like 30 seconds for each book, then they're not going to be happy. And, um, that's where we want to strive at. So we're going to identify APIs that affect user-related workflows uh, and make, that, make them work. And believe me, the APIs that at the top of this list of the slowest APIs, they are mostly related for searches and for uh, check-ins and check-outs. Any, anything else? Okay. Okay. All Thanks right. for your time, guys. Thanks, Anton. <clears throat> okay. Um, just a few slides left. Um, we will meet again after Sprint 59. Uh, 58, which just started, is a two-week sprint. Then we have 59, also a two-week sprint. Um, and per Jakob's release milestone, uh, feature freeze is actually in the middle of sprint 59. So we've got three weeks of development left before feature freeze. And then all of the teams have um, put in the uh, plans for coming sprints. So if you want to see what everybody's planning to work on in the next couple of sprints, you can come take a look. And that's really all we had. <clears throat> Any last questions or thoughts? <clears throat> All right, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your presentations. Um, and uh, we will send out a link to the deck and the recording shortly. Have a great day.